Meeting, and I will now take this adherent for this special meeting of the Council held on the 18th of January 2023. Um, I'm just, I've managed to capture most, so I'll just check the, the people that I haven't managed to capture and then I'll read out the apologies at the end. Um, we don't seem to have Councillor, Councillor Archie Buchanan. Um, I'll just check. We have Councillor Dewar. I was checking that. Um, I'm just going to check if we have Councillor Horn. Yep, we have Councillor Horn. Councillor Keat. Oh, thanks, Councillor Devlin. Councillor Lambie. I'll just check if he's participating remotely. Yes, we've got Councillor Lambie. Councillor Logan. I'll check. Um, don't seem with Councillor Logan. I don't see her online. Okay, we can check that out. I don't see her just now online. Um, Councillor Loudon. Yeah, we have Councillor Loudon online. Um, Councillor Nugent, I'll check. Yep, we have Councillor Nugent. I'll just check for Councillor Razak. Yep, we have Councillor Razak. Okay, we have apologies from Councillor Bradley, Councillor Archie Buchanan looks as if he's not here. We have apologies from Councillor Hamilton, Councillor McAdams, Councillor Nelson and Councillor Ross. And I'll hand back to the Provost, thank you. Thank you. Um, are there it? Councillor Horsham. Press again. Press it again, please. Sorry, I'm, I don't mean to make it my New Year's resolution to get on your, your nerves um, this early in the new year, but um, Archie Buchanan, can I put the apologies in for, for him, please? Okay, I've you. got a message. Thank you. Okay, are there any declarations of interest? None. Okay, I'm going to move on then to item two on the agenda, which is an update on the budget strategy. Now, there are three papers on our full council meeting this morning, and uh, one paper is for decision making and two are for noting. And just at the outset, I would say that um, these papers have been out with group leaders. You have all got them, and I understand that there's going to be political discussion within your groups regarding the papers for noting. I'm happy to take short points for clarification, but you can do that with Paul at any time after the meeting. Um, so if we can try to confine ourselves to those uh, things, that would be excellent. Um, so we'll move on then and ask Paul to present the, the first paper, which is on pages 3 to 26, and it's an update on the budget strategy 23-24. Okay, thanks, Provost. So th this is an update on the budget strategy for 23-24. And, and given that update, I'm going to focus on two things. There are really two parts to the paper. The first part looks to update the position in terms of the budget gap that we've got. Right? So, so that's the extent of uh, the issue that we have within our 23-24 budget and how that's moved since the last time we spoke. The next part of the paper is looking at the options that are in front of you to close that budget gap. So I'll move on with, with, the, with the first part, uh, and that's looking at an update on that budget gap position. Now, the last time I brought a paper on this, and this was the, the, the subject of uh, a presentation that we made to all members in the middle of November, we identified a budget gap of £10.5 million. 
So th there was a lot involved in getting to that position. I'm not going to recap in, on that this morning, but we'll use that as our starting point in today's discussion. Things that have happened since then, we have had a budget settlement, right? So that's reflected in these figures. The paper also notes at 3.3 that we have uh, had meetings of the Council's Budget Working Group. So there have been uh, two referenced there, 15th and 22nd of December. There was also one that took place on the 12th of January last week. So the uh, bullet points at the foot of the first page just cover off what's in this paper. And it's really split into those two parts that I talked about. Update of the budget gap the options that are there to close the gap, and then there's a summary at the end. So what I'll do quickly is, is take you through the update to the budget gap. There are a number of things uh, which are covered in Table 1 in the paper. Table 1 really summarises this, and I'll talk quickly through the items that are in there. And they're the things that you can see on pages 4 and 5 of your council papers. So the first thing that's down there is a rates revaluation into 2023-24. That increases the budget gap by nearly £3 million. And we did actually make reference to this in the last paper, that this was a potential burden that was going to fall. This is uh, down to a rates revaluation that's taking place and increases in the rateable value of the council's properties. And in part, that's down to the inflationary climate that we're currently in. The next thing that's down in the table and in the paper is an extra amount of £9.2 million that I'm suggesting goes in to the council's budget. It's covering two headings, pay award and inflation. You'll see the detail there. This is down to the burden that I think we can reasonably anticipate that we'll have to pick up for a pay award for 2023-24. And it also re reflects the fact that our estimates of inflation are likely to have to be increased. And this relates to, to the big contracts that we've got. It refers there to PPP and waste and the fact that we are bound in to RPI increases in these contracts. And that will really be based around the, IP, the RPI as it stands for January 2022. We think that is likely to be higher than we previously budgeted. So between these two things, I'm looking to put another £9.2 million into the budget. Similarly, there's an increase uh, going in there. It says utilities and water. The thing that's driving that is, is increased water costs that we're projecting into next year. At 4.7 on the table, and you, you can see the, the item that's mentioned there is parking permits. To the last council meeting, 7th de uh, December, there was a, a reversal of a, a previous saving around parking permits. That means I need to add £25,000 into the budget. You'll appreciate that that's at the margin of what we're talking about here. Then we get to an item uh, which is about settlement. Now, the things that have, have come up to this point all made the budget gap bigger, right? This shrinks it, and it shrinks it uh, to the tune of just under six and a quarter million pounds. So what the paper says is, on a like-for-like -like basis, there's a movement in grant into 2023-24 of 4.88 million pounds, right? So that improves our position. We'd also banked on losing about one and a third million pounds in grant, which was reflective of our improved position in council tax. That hasn't happened to the same extent. So we get an improved position of just under six and a quarter million pounds. So that makes the gap a bit better. We've then got uh, two items which are down savings from reviews. So one of them increases the budget gap, the other one reduces it. The one that increases the budget gap is to do with the fact that when we put the paper in front of you before, we said, look, in getting to that budget gap of ten and a half million pounds, you'll understand there are some savings that we've assumed you're going to take. So, and this is in line with discussions at the budget working group. We're trying to present this on a consistent basis. So there's an appendix at the rear that contains all of the items that you would need to approve. So this is about putting things on an equal footing. So we're no longer assuming you're going to take those things. We're putting them in as items for decision. 
right? That will come uh, at a future meeting, but it increases the budget gap by one and a half million pounds. And then the final item there, which says 24-25 savings from reviews, there has been continued review activity. We've identified more savings, uh, 2.1 million pounds of those relate to management and operational decisions which can be taken, uh, which would improve the position in year 2024-25. So we could take the benefit of those in this current budget exercise, but we need to put in some one-off funding to bridge the gap for 2023-24 until those things come online. So what you've got is, is that list of items. That's summarised on page six of your papers in table one. And what that means, uh, because we were, we were adding in that money, the three million pound for rates revaluation, we added in uh, nine, just over nine for pay award and inflation. Those are the, 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 the main big uplifts. The benefit from the grant settlement moves the position back by about six million pounds. So in net terms overall, the budget gap would move from 10 and a half million pounds to 16.318 million pounds. You can see that figure in the shaded line at the foot of the table. So that's the first bit of this paper. That's an update of the position that we're trying to deal with. Updating the budget for what we know and building in the settlement. A point I would make to you, that this is just indicative of the extent to which this budget's been different from the ones that we've done uh, you know, definitely over the past 10 years. And the, the thing that makes it different is inflation and the extent to which we've had to come back and come back again to say, look, this is making things worse. And then back again to say even more worse, where we've had to extend that budget gap. So yeah, that's the thing that's different about this year's budget. So we end that part of the paper with a revised budget gap of £16.3 million. So the next part of the paper is really covered in section five. That begins halfway down page six of the paper. And it says, look, there are options to close that budget gap of 16.3 million pounds. And then we go on to quote three things, right, which are dealt with in the remainder of the paper. First of those is potential increases to council tax. The second one is the use of service concessions. And the third one is the consideration of proposed savings. So the remainder of the paper goes through these measures which could uh, eliminate that budget gap and take us to a balanced budget position for year 2023-24. So I'll, I'll try as briefly as I can to go through each of those in turn. Council tax. So the, the section of the paper goes through things you know already about the, the, the rationale behind council tax and the role that that can play in the budget. And the second table in the paper, which is at uh, page seven, table two, council tax increases. On the left-hand side of that table, you can see a range of potential percentage increases in council tax. Now that's indicative, right? you, know, you, you could have higher increases than that 6%. This isn't capped at a particular level. But we've quoted uh, percentage increases from zero through to 6%. If you go across to the right-hand side, you can see the impact that those percentage increases could have on the budget gap. A percentage increase we've talked about in the, ha uh, in the past was 3.5%. That would bring in 5.1 million pounds to close that gap. A percentage increase of 6% would close the gap by 8.7. So you, you see the picture there. The columns in the middle, for example, uh, the one-headed monthly increase over 10 payments, given most people pay this uh, by a, a, month, a monthly standing order, which is taking uh, 10 months of the year, that's what the increase would be right, to that monthly payment uh, of each of the, those increases. That's at band D of the council tax. So you start to get uh, an idea of the impact that that could have. So that's council tax. The next thing I said I'd talk to you about is service concessions. Now there is a paper which is, is coming next on the agenda, which goes through that. And I'll, I'll not go into this in a lot of detail because I will in that next paper, right? But 
Remember, this is about how we account for the costs of the PPP contracts. And it's about stretching uh, how we pay for these in effect out over the life of the asset and the benefit that can be gained from that. So there is a, a point in there where it talks about an annual benefit and it talks about a retrospective benefit of £64 million. And in discussions with yourself previously, and again in this paper, I've made, I make reference to how that could be used right, across the uh, period of the, the Council's budget strategy, using amounts particularly in 23-24, uh, 24-25 and 25-26 to ease the budget position in those years. Now, per that outline plan, uh, the, and this is the key point in this section of the paper, if we use the service concession benefit as it's described in the paper, then that could take a further £5.7 million from that budget gap. So that's the, the content that's in there on service concessions. And again, I'll come back to this in the next paper. So we had a budget gap of £16.3 million. If the service concessions option is taken, you could take £5.7 million from that. That table at the top of the page gives you an idea of the extent to which you could shrink the £16.3 million by increasing council tax. What is then covered in the paper is the, the content that's in the appendix at the rear, that's appendix two, which are savings options for members' consideration. Now, these are just in at this point for noting to make you aware of them. Uh, and the provost went through the, the, the protocol around discussion and eventual approval of these at the beginning of the meeting. So in the appendix that we've got with the savings at the rears, there are two main uh, groups of savings, and these are covered at 511.1 and then at 511.2. It gives you a summary of them. The first are savings from reviews, right? And these are uh, uh, some of the things that I referred to earlier in the meeting that we need to put in front of yourselves for decision eventually. And then there are the things described at 511.2, which are flexibilities. And it gives the background to those in section 511. So these are items right, which across the, the period from August to October, local government via COSLA approached the Scottish government with. So these are a list of potential flexibilities that could be called upon, which may release funding, which could help with council's funding pressures. So these were identified by COSLA discussed with the government. The Scottish government came back via a letter from the Deputy First Minister, and the content of that is contained at 5.11.3. And the Deputy First Minister said, look, it's for individual councils to consider the needs of their communities with a focus on the most vulnerable, their obligations, and the totality of the resource funding available to them, and then to take decisions necessary openly and transparently to operate as effectively as possible within this context. So this has been viewed, and this is covered in the paper, by local government as being a permissive letter from the Deputy First Minister. He was giving the councils what they were looking for in terms of flexibility around those items. There were caveats included uh, within that, right, which is covered at the end of 5.11.3, where funding is provided a specific revenue grant, council should engage with the relevant Scottish Government directorate. And again, there has been a degree of content about these things in the settlement letters from the Scottish Government. And some of the nuances around those are covered in sections 5.11.4 through to 5.11.7. The paper has... Uh, covered up to this point. So I'm at the foot of page eight. I'm at 5.12. We've talked about that restated budget gap. We've talked about what could be done to close the remaining gap. Council tax, service concessions and savings, right? And within savings, we've talked about the review activity and we've talked about these flexibilities. The paper finishes off just by noting a couple of other areas. 
The first of them is the 2022-23 position. So at this point in time, my staff are, are concluding an exercise which goes through the current year's budget and tries to identify what we think the position is going to be at the end of the year. And that's referenced at 5.12 at the foot of uh, the page. So we, we believe at this point there is likely to be a positive position in comparison to the budget. We're in the process of finalising that and we'll bring that to the Executive Committee at the beginning of next month. Right, so, so that's one thing that's yet to be concluded. That might offer a degree of scope to manage some of the pressure, particularly where we look to one-off monies identified within this paper. But we'll come back to that later on. The paper then uh, looks at South Lanarkshire Leisure and Culture Trust and the Integrated Joint Board. And the, the point that's been made there, first about the Leisure Trust, this paper's described a whole series of challenges, and you've heard me say this has been a budget unlike any other that we've dealt with across the past 10 years anyway. These challenges that we face, these have been experienced by SLLCT as well. And it will mean an impact on SLLCT income and expenditure, and that includes pay. So the trust board will require to take decisions in order to arrive at a balanced budget position in the same way that we will, and to achieve, uh, and to achieve a sustainable financial position. So it's just noting the fact that the trust board has, has got that process to go through. And then, similarly, for at 6.2, it references the IJB, the increased cost that will be faced there, eh, and the fact that efficiency savings identified will require to be approved by the IJB. The Section 7 gives a summary, right? And, and I've tried to summarise as I've gone through, so I'll not go through this again in a whole lot of detail, but it's about those points around restated budget gap and the options for closing that gap. What it then points ahead to, just at section 8, and this is on page 10 of the paper, is a timeline to approval. So just recapping on the point the provost made at the head of the meeting, this item is for noting. There's none of these things being put in front of you uh, as decisions to take today. But what we do show at section 8 is a timeline for approval. Part of that references a uh, January, a, a special meeting uh, to consider the HRA budget, which is uh, going to take place on the 23rd of January. And then into February, there is an executive committee. The expectation is that that HRA budget will go to the executive committee. And then we point to a meeting on the 22nd of February, where there would be a special council meeting. That would finish off the process for the HRA budget. But the implication in here is that that council meeting would consider the council budget. That would mean approval of savings measures, if you were looking to approve any, and approval of the council tax and the setting of the council tax. So in terms of the recommendations, if I can just go back to the beginning of this paper, you can see the recommendations on page three. And it's really, as I've said throughout the meeting, it's looking for noting of that updated uh, budget strategy and that residual budget gap restated at £16.3 million. Noting of the options to meet the budget gap and noting of the, the summary and next steps uh, in terms of taking this process forward. So I'm happy to take any questions, Provost, given the, the outline that you gave at the beginning of the meeting. Thank you. Colleagues, can we agree to note the paper? Agreed. Um, as Paul said, this is a paper for noting, and if there are any urgent points for clarification, uh, not for debate, but for clarification, uh, Paul will take those questions just now. Um, debate will go back to your uh, individual groups, and I understand in the past that Paul has visited some of the group meetings to clarify uh, matters, and I think he's still willing to do that uh, on this budget uh, itself. So um, only uh, urgent points for clarification this morning. Uh, Maureen Chalmers. Paul, for 
going through the paper, it's a really comprehensive paper. We will take that time um, to consider and discuss within our group and, um, and time with yourself too, if that's possible. So I'm going to just clarify, um, I know we went live with our public consultation and community engagement work yesterday and clarify that that's underway, but can I also ask if we're going to be briefing or, and or consulting other partners, including trade unions? Uh, thanks, Councillor Chalmers, and uh, thanks, Provost. In, in terms of consultation with the trade unions, uh, I have already discussed this paper with the trade unions just in advance of this meeting. So, so they've got that. I've left it with them. I'm, I'm giving the same invitation as, as I've given to yourselves. If they've got any questions on that, if they can come back to me with them. And what we will do, if there are questions, for example, on the savings proposals that are in there at the rear of the paper. We'll do the same thing that we've done in previous years. If an answer has been given to one party, one member or one, one group, uh, we'll make sure that's circulated around everybody, and that includes the trade unions. So the unions have been brought up to date with that, and they were, they were comfortable with that as a position, Councillor Chalmers. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. OK, thank you. We'll move on to item three on the agenda. Uh, now, please, and that's on service concessions, and it's pages 27 to 42. Um, can I invite Paul Manning to uh, speak on the paper? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Provost. So th this is th the thing that I referred to right a few minutes ago, and I said I would go into more detail because it's the subject of this separate paper. Now, what this is about is the fact that we could change the way we account for the costs of our PPP schools. And that can give the council access to funds that it can use over the next couple of years, and it can assist with the budget position over that period. So what the paper starts off by talking about is what prompted this. Uh, and it notes at 3.1 that uh, as part of the spending review in May, the government announced that the implementation of service concessions guidance was accessible to councils. And this is about PPP contracts. And section three goes through some of the facts about our contracts. So for example, how long the school deal lasts and how it's accounted for. And it also does note, and this is at 3.8, that there is a, a much, much smaller uh, PPP contract that we're involved in uh, apart from the schools, which was, is about what was called, I don't know if it's still called this, the Glasgow Southern Orbital Road. So this is the road that, that runs from East Kilbride out through East Renfrewshire and joins onto the M77. So that was done as part of a PPP deal. And because the first, I think, half mile of it runs across South Lanarkshire Territory, we've got an interest in that. And this is affected by this as well. So we've got these two PPP deals. What the paper goes through after that is the principles behind the implementation of this service concession guidance, and then looks at the financial implications, and then it gives an outline of how the monies which are raised through this could be used. So first of all, if, if I can talk about the principles behind the service concession guidance, and this is covered in section four. So a key point for us is that the contract for the PPP schools lasts for 30 years, but the schools themselves will last for 50. So what this new guidance means uh, is really down to three points that are covered in section 4.2. What that means is, or what this guidance means is, we can account for the payment for the assets over that expected life of the schools of 50 years instead of the 30 years of the contract. What that means is it better matches the debt costs of the PPP schools to the expected useful life of them. And what it critically means is we'd be repaying the cost of the debt over a longer period of time. Right, so in short, because we would be paying for these schools over 50 years instead of 30, we would pay less each year. There's a point made at the foot of the, the page, which says, look, this doesn't change our contract. 
right? So the, the deal with the, the PPP provider who are called Inspired, that doesn't change. They still get cash payments in the same way that they would. It's simply how we account for the costs. Now, the guidance uh, that comes in, right, which is covered in the first part of the paper, allows this. There are actually three options, right, which are allowed by the guidance. So I'll, I'll let you know them at this point. The first thing is that we keep uh, going the, the way we are currently, no change, but there wouldn't be any benefit from that. There is a second option, uh, which is one about moving to a different system of depreciation. It's completely inconsistent with how we account for our other assets, and therefore I'm not going to suggest that as an option that's taken. But the third option is the one that I outline in this paper, and that's about matching what's uh, accounted for within the council's books uh, to the asset life rather than the contract period. So that's what we pick up and we use as the basis for the remainder of this paper. Now, importantly, and this is covered at the top of page 29 of the paper, we can apply this change retrospectively. So we, we can change what we're doing, but we can change it from the beginning of the contract period. And what that means is that up to this point, in effect, we've paid too much through the council's accounts for the schools, right? Because we'll have been overpaying in each year up to this point. And these are contracts that have been running for about 15 years up to this point. So what that does is it creates an overpayment in our accounts with too much having been charged to the revenue account up to this point to pay for the assets. And that's covered in section 4.5 in the paper. Now the next section, which is financial implications, that goes into detail on these benefits, right? And it also goes into a bit of detail on the costs of doing this. So at 5.3, on the, the retrospective benefit, there is a figure of £64 million quoted. Now this is a key point in this paper. And this is the amount that we will, as I've just said, have overpaid up to this point in time by. And what the paper's saying at 5.3 is this can be taken as a financial benefit and transferred to reserves. And the increase in the council's reserves balance can be used to support our budget strategy going forward. And I'll come back to that detail uh, in, in, a, in a second. So that's a key point in this. Right, there's also a recurring annual benefit, right, and that we're, we'll be paying less each year because we're paying for something over 50 years instead of over 30 years. So that's covered off at 5.4, right? There are uh, points in there about the costs of doing this. So at 5.6, what it talks about is the fact that there's going to be repayment over a longer term because it's over 50 years instead of over 30. So we'll be paying for this for a longer period of time. However, at the end of the 30-year contract, we will still have the budget for the PPP repayments, and we can use that to make that payment for the longer period of time. Right? And that's uh, given a wee bit more detail at the top of page 30 of your paper, where it says, look, by the time we get to 2040, 41, we'll actually have an excess of budget of 44 million pounds, which could be used to make those payments over that longer period of time. And there would still be headroom within that figure of 44 million pounds. And again, a key point uh, that this is reinforced right at 5.9, the additional costs of lengthening the repayment period won't therefore represent any additional revenue budget pressure as they can be managed within that PPP budget available. We're not paying the contractor for longer and we're not paying the contractor more. That still happens over a 30-year period. It's about how we account for this. 5.10 then goes through costs linked to using the retrospective benefit. So this is about the fact that we've got a plan to use the money, right, as opposed to making the change itself. 
So section 5.10 talks about the costs arising from using these benefits. And those are, as I say, costs of using that money rather than costs of adopting the guidance. Uh, 5.11 refers to what those costs could be and the process that we've identified through which we could manage those. Part of those would be increased interest costs and how those could be managed. And what we have done is gone the extra mile in this report, just given the importance of this issue. And we've shown in detail, and this is in the paper, and it's in a, an appendix at the rear, the detail of how we would accommodate that extra cost within our cash management plans. What the paper then goes on to talk about is, is using that service concession benefit. So this paper itself is about agreeing the principle of the change. It's not about spending the benefits. And to get approval on how we would use those, we'll come back through budget papers, right? And, and I'd point specifically to that paper, uh, first of all, on the 22nd of February. So again, just recapping on those benefits, what are they? It's a £64 million retrospective benefit and a £4 million recurring benefit. And uh, the, the rest of section six of the paper talks about how we could look to use this. And I go back to that point earlier on that I made in terms of the 23-24 budget, that could close that gap uh, that we have of 16.3 million pounds. This step could close it by 5.7 million pounds. The paper at 6.5 talks about, and this refers to, to discussions we've had previously, our budget strategy and consideration being given to using nearly £43 million of that to support the Council's medium-term budget strategy across 2024-25 and 25-26 through using that amount of £42.6 million to support that in those years. If we followed that approach, it would still leave an amount of £10 million unallocated. And that's touched on at the end of 6.5. So, while I'm not looking for approval of the use of the money, it is an important aspect of this paper. Through making a, or taking the decision to do this and using the money in this way, you could keep the budget gap at a moderate level for year 2024-25, right? So that's the next financial year after the one that we're pre preparing for at the moment. It doesn't take away our budget problems, right, in the long term. But what it does do is give time to prepare and to adapt to what the council does in order to meet that budget gap, but over a longer period of time. If we don't take the opportunity that's in this paper, we will be faced with significantly greater problems in 22-23, 23-24, and a budget gap in excess of £30 million, but in 24 25 If the route that's mapped out in this paper is taken, that budget gap will still come, but eventually. But what you would get is a period of two years, and that's 23 24 and 24 25 to prepare for that budget gap. But that approach is only justifiable if the council makes good use of that time. So section six finishes off, but by pointing towards what happens next. And, and in terms of the use of the money, that would be uh, brought to you, you know, the first part of that is part of the 23-24 budget strategy. So there's a summary given at section seven. It talks about the gains that are achievable, and it talks about the costs which have been shown in the paper, but how those could be managed right, within what the council does. And at 7.6, the paper finishes off by giving my own view on this, which is that this is an affordable, sustainable and prudent step that could be taken. It's a step that offers significant opportunity in managing the budget for the next couple of years, giving time to make change within the council's budget. So if I can go back to the recommendations within the paper, the first of those is the one that's for approval and it's for implementation 
of the service concession guidance. And the other three things that are in there are for noting. Noting of the, uh, the, the benefits is outlined at recommendation two. Noting of the costs right, and how they uh, could be dealt with across the period of time. And noting of the costs of borrowing and the plan that's in there in terms of managing that. So again, I'll pass back to your, yourself, Provost, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, are there any questions or comments? Katie Loudon. Thank you very much, Provost, um, and thank you, Paul, for going through what is um, a complicated paper about a complicated matter so clearly. Um, this really refers to 4.5, which is the, the crux of this paper, really, that we're, we're going to have the option to account for paying for these assets over their life um, of the asset rather than the, the length of the contract. Um, I do apologise for the, the crystal ball nature of this question. Um, really, it's to plant a flag in the sand for the generation of councillors that are going to be potentially sitting here in, in 30 years' time. Um, with these contracts being signed in 2006, using those schools at that time would be the equivalent of schools being built in the mid-50s onwards, really being used today. Um, I've taught in schools that were at the end of their useful life or, frankly, beyond the end of their useful life, and it was often beginning to become a real headache for all concerned and certainly for those local authorities by that time. Uh, my questions then are, is the option for some forward planning for replacement or refurbishment going to be baked into this change to accounting practices so that those councillors are not going to be faced with a situation where all of the buildings are going to be needing drastic work or replacement at the same time. Um, so essentially, would this change in our accounting practice just now um, have any effect on their ability to arrange credit in the years approaching the end of this 50-year period so that they can take action? Thank you. Paul. Well. Hey, th thanks, Councillor Loudon, and thanks, Provost. Uh, first of all, one, one thing to point out, within the current contract, there is a maintenance regime which, which is built in, right? So that's a, a fundamental part of the contract, which maintains the schools at a level of condition to the point that they're handed over to us. This isn't going to change any of that. Right, so it's, it's not going to change the contract and it's not going to change that maintenance regime. So th there's, there's nothing to fear in that respect. What it does do is it allows the cost of the assets to be better matched to the asset life, right? which is, the, is the, the justification for doing this. There is a significant benefit which accrues from that, which I talk about in the paper, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't change the condition of those assets. At the end of this point in time, or at the end of the, at the end of the contract, we would need to be, to prepare anyway to switch to our own maintenance regime. I talk in there about, about an amount of money, which is really the amount of money that we're paying to the contractor currently, and that's the, the amount that the council's paying, not the amount that the government gives us to pass on. That's going to be available, and across the next. Uh, 10 year period, we will be making plans to switch from a maintenance regime, which is done through the contract, to one that we fund. So, we, we and I'll come back to just another point on that in a second, we won't be waiting to that point to figure that all out and prepare for it. That, that's really starting now. The other thing that's in this is carbon reduction commitments and net zero, and the switch to that and the role the contractor plays in that, and the role the council plays in that, and maybe even more fundamentally, the role that the Scottish Government plays in that. Right. So that is going to be, uh, in terms of how buildings and schools are run, and how changes to them are funded and put in place, these are all things that we're going to need to be preparing for between now and the end of that contract. Thanks, Councillor. Okay. You happy with that, Katie? Yep. Any other questions or comments? Okay, can we agree? Uh, item uh, one or, or two one is uh, the item for agreement. Can we agree that, colleagues? And can you note items two, three, and four 
for further discussion at a later date. Thank you. Uh, can we move on to item three? Uh, sorry, item four on today's agenda. And I'm going to take a five-minute break just before we start that for our BSL users. Thank you.
Thank you, Councillor Convery. I keep meaning to bring that to you, Gable down. I know. Right. It's usually the handcuffs I've got to bring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll move on um, to our a final paper this morning, uh, which is uh, on the capital challenges. And again, Paul's in the hot seat, and it's in pages 43 to 46. Paul. Okay, thanks, Provost. So this is, this is a paper that's outlining the, the challenges that the Council faces in putting together a capital programme for next year. Right, what you'll have noticed is it's not a capital programme for next year. I would expect that to come uh, specifically to that meeting that we've talked about on the 22nd of February. What this is trying to do is just to lay a, a bit of groundwork for a capital programme for 23-24 and give you a bit of background into some of the major factors that are impacting on putting together a programme of capital spend for next year. And the first of those is funding constraints. And this is covered at, at section four. You will have heard me uh, say this before. See, across the past three years, the level of capital resource that councils are working with has decreased significantly. So, uh, it references there the fact that we, we were working with capital grant, and this had run for, a, for a, a long period of years in the order of about £28 million. And what we have seen since 2021 is a reduction in that level of, of capital grant down to just over £21. Right, so that's the, the, the figure that's appearing in our settlement for year 2023-24. So you're, you're looking at a third of a cut in the capital grant resource that we've got. Uh, against that, you can see uh, that there, there are other pieces of grant that we get, for example, for, for city deal and for uh, other general capital works. But these are for specific things, right? So, for example, we get grant for a, a, a vacant and derelict land uh, monies as well, which is, is by and large to re reuse it to remediate contaminated land. The points made there at the foot of the page, you can borrow to fund capital works, but what you borrow has to be paid back, and that would become another burden on a revenue budget, which we know is already very, very stretched. So that's funding, and the pressures around funding. The second page in the paper talks about expenditure pressures. Uh, and makes the point that in putting together a capital programme you know, for, for a long period of time, that there are things where we've uh, looked to our capital programme to pick up a burden, and we are highly likely to have to do that again moving forward. So things like schools, information, communication technology, that there, there is a major contract that the Council has through education to provide the ICT infrastructure and systems within schools, which works really well at the moment. Uh, and we, part of that we fund through our capital programme. We fund things uh, through the capital programme as well. Coming back to some of the items that uh, Councillor Loudon referenced for the secondary schools, remember we have to do similar things for the primary school. We, we have a, a, a really good a primary school estate, we have the best primary school estate in Scotland, and we have asset management plans and life cycle uh, replacement plans within those schools and within all our buildings. So we, we do try and keep uh, to a, a level of maintenance the assets that we've currently got. And the point that's been made there at the end of that paragraph 5.1, over the piece, right, we have included a significant amount within our capital programme in respect of investment in roads. Uh, that's, as it says there, it's formed a big part of what we do in our capital programme. If we assume that that's going to continue, that does commit almost all of our general capital grant that the council receives. So it means there's limited scope to do other things. 5.3 picks up Another point that I've made across the period uh, of the meeting this morning, which is the pressure that we've got coming from inflation. 
the way that it's pushed up costs within our revenue budget, it does the same within our capital budget. So we, we reference some, some figures in there. Road services have advised that the industry price increases on capital works are, are looking at around 25 to 30 per cent in terms of an inflationary increase. You can see figures quoted uh, from the construction industry by housing and technical resources. So these impact on what we're doing and the, the impact on the scope and scale of what can be done. And this is an environment that has really taken off or really deteriorated across the past year. And 5.4, again, I would go back to a point that I made in response to Councillor Loudon's question. We do need to bear in mind we have these carbon reduction targets which are approaching the likely cost of those. And there is a link in the papers to a really good piece of work that was done by Housing and Technical Resources, which went to the Climate uh, Change and Sustainability Committee. We started to attach figures to some of these works as we move through the next two decades. So all of these things right, impact on what we do and the impact on our ability to keep going with uh, you know, our way of putting together a capital programme which has become a par for the course right, across maybe the past 10 to 15 years. What that means, we start to cover in section six. So some of the challenges that you're likely to see, it's unlikely that we'll be able to undertake all the works that are required, given the squeeze in funding and the pressure on expenditure. Not everything is going to be able to be replaced on a like-for-like -like basis. We may be in a position where, given the current climate, we have to think about whether right now is the right time to undertake certain works. You could, or we, we could come to, the, to a view that we're at a peak in the market and maybe it's more prudent to wait till we get a climate that's a bit more forgiving in terms of costs. There may also, and this is covered at 6.3, uh, have to be decisions taken about what assets we need to keep to carry out the activities that you think we need to undertake over the coming years. And moving on to, to page 45, and this is the end of section six, there is another aspect to, to capital expenditure that can become lost in this, uh, which is the fact that capital, ex capital investment may be a route that we do have, and one of the few routes that we do have, which can facilitate change. So capital investment to facilitate that change and potentially reduce costs moving forward is something that I do think needs to be considered when putting together a capital programme. So section seven really starts to uh, put together a short summary of those points. I've talked through with you the, the the squeeze on funding that we, we experience, the pressures that we're seeing on expenditure and the challenges that that feeds into. So where do we go now with this? And that's covered at section 7.4. A paper will be drafted which will present members with a 23-24 capital programme for their consideration. It will be based on that known level of government grant and other uh, already known uh, and approved borrowing and external funding sources. So that will come back to that meeting on the 22nd of February. So if I can go back to the recommendation uh, provost that's in there, it's really for noting of the content that I've talked to you through this morning. And again, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, provost. Thanks, Paul. Are there any questions or uh, comments? Andrea. Uh, thank you, Provost. Um, thanks, Paul. Um, can I just say thanks for the last paper? Because I was kind of struggling to, to fully um, understand um, the concession stuff. And um, halfway through your um, paper, I suddenly got it. And I'm very thankful for that. Thank you. Um, but I just wanted to ask very quickly about the cost of materials. Um, you reference it at 5.3, um, road services and housing and technical. Um, and you see, I mean, obviously, the roads in particular, the costs have gone up 25 to 30 percent. 
Um, but I just wondered, you've said where possible efficiencies will be sought um, through looking at different materials which, that can be used. Um, and I'm just, I just want to make a point really that sometimes buying cheaper, if you can access it in the long run, you know, is false economy. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, to highlight that and hope that the officers, when they're looking at alternate materials, um, will not just be driven by cost, um, so that, you know, the, the repairs and so on that are carried out um, and the, the roads and, and housing works are to a high standard. Thanks. Uh, thanks, councillor, and, and again, just just through, through the provost, fully uh, aware right, of uh, the argument that you've just described, right, and, and the false economies that, that can lie in there. What that's about uh, is about you know looking everywhere and at every possibility, right, around what could be done, right. But the the roads team and David are absolutely acutely aware, right, of, of the folly of, of putting in place a solution that isn't going to be uh, that, that isn't uh, going to pass muster, right, or, or have any kind of longevity, right, in terms of a, a repair or putting in place a resurfacing project for, for roads. So, so rest assured in that, it's simply about saying, look, we will try everything, right, to, you know, in terms of sourcing, because some of our routes, right, because of what's happened over the past year, in terms of uh, sources for things like bitumen and sources for things like steel have closed off, right, and, and we're left having to pay increased inflationary prices for commodities. We will look everywhere, we will try everything, but there won't be that sort of compromise. What it does mean though is if things are more expensive and you're working within a fixed envelope of money, fewer things end up being done. Right? So I, I, I don't know if David would have anything to add to that. Thanks, Paul. Um, Councillor Allison wishes to speak, and he's promised me colleagues that he's not going to mention bridges. <laughs> I'll need to think very carefully how I mention the assets we have that cover railways and rivers are then dealt with. Um, slightly different to that, Paul. You've mentioned quite clearly in the paper here about how the capital budget can influence the revenue budget and investing and saving in your revenue expenditure. But the opposite is also true, that if, for instance, maintenance is not taking place and identifying problems before they arrive, the old adage, a stitch in time saves nine. Um, has there been any evaluation done on the changes we've made over the last decade to the revenue budget so we are not carrying out the maintenance measures to the same standard and we're now running into problems? Um, that the capital budget will need to deal with. Has that been quantified and evaluated at all? So, uh, Councillor Allison, in, in, in terms of putting together the capital uh, programme, right, and, and putting together this paper, and in putting together the paper earlier on in the agenda, right, th th there is a theme, right, in, in terms of working within a fixed or a diminishing pot of money Right, and trying to carry out activities that are becoming more expensive. Right, so you, you know, that that is the undertone of this. From the perspective of, of putting together a capital program and putting together revenue programs, and in particular roads programs, there is active discussion right about the balance of what is done. Right, so that will continue in putting together the 23-24 revenue and capital programs with roads around the sort of rearward looking exercise that we're talking about, I would need to pick that up with David and his team to see what has been done, the sort of things you're talking about around measures that have been taken to step back from spend right across that period. And, and I think in the past we've talked about things that maybe even go back beyond that, right? Uh, to look at what has changed, what the impact is, and whether there's a different way forward that could be taken. See around the, the uh, the, 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 around the section that you have gravitated to there around don't lose sight of the fact that capital spend can help with your revenue position moving forward. That's something we're, we're acutely aware of. And I think, as, I think yourselves as elected members and ourselves as a corporate management team have been 
alive to and open to that. So if, if things are brought forward that have the capacity to save money moving forward through spending more in the capital programme, an example of that would be a the new social work system right, and the changes that can be made there, then the council is taking decisions, you know, based on a business case, based on revenue savings moving forward, justifying that capital spend. The council's taking decisions to do that. And, I, you know, I would not suggest that changes. And that would apply for things like road in the same way that it would for other assets. So absolutely open to this, councillor. presented this morning, and I know that he doesn't do that alone, uh, Jackie's there with him, um, they're complex papers and he does his utmost to clarify them and make them as clear for all of us who are non-accountancy professionals to understand them and help us to make decisions. So thank you very much to the team. Okay, um, I think we can close the meeting now. Thank you for your attendance.